three speakers that are coming to us all the way from Belgium. We have Seth Van Poulen. She's the chair in, in the chair in digital information at the Information and Communication Science Department at the Free University of Brussels. His research focuses on metadata in the cultural heritage sector and documentation practices in large public and private bodies. He also works as a consultant on the topic of digital cultural heritage and is active as a trainer in the domain of records and document management for the European Commission. Seth is also a member of the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative, Dublin Core Metadata Initiative Advisory Board. And then we have at the far end there is Max De Vilda. Max is a PhD candidate and teaching assistant in the Information and Communication Sciences and Technologies Department at the Free University of Brussels. He has a master's degree in linguistics and an advanced degree in computational linguistics. Currently is writing his dissertation on the impact of language independent information extraction on document retrieval. And we also have here Ruben Rabor. Ruben is a researcher at the Multimedia Lab at Ghent University and also with the Interdisciplinary Institute for Broadband Technology. His interests include semantic web technologies, multimedia annotation, artificial intelligence, and the relation to multimedia processing. Currently, he's working on moving multimedia algorithms to the web and on associated problems such as semantic service descriptions. Today, they will be speaking about their research project, Free Your Metadata. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Robbie. And first of all, uh, thank you very much for having us here at Columbia. I think Ruben, Max, and uh, myself are very much excited to be here and to uh, talk to you today about our uh, research project uh, for your metadata. So today we will discuss how you can use uh, technologies and tools to um, augment metadata quality. And uh, throughout our work, but also today in our uh, presentation, we really attach a lot of value to uh, hands-on practice and uh, exp experimentation with data and technologies. And this is really kind of a result or an outcome of observing the sometimes this delicate dance that you probably all know between users and uh, technologies or tools. So like in the context of an iPhone, you're using an iPhone, but sometimes uh, it may seem like the iPhone is actually using you. And uh, this also just really applies to the context of uh, the semantic web or digital uh, or, um, and linked data in the sense that as librarians or people working in the cultural heritage sector, uh, we have been discussing this uh, over uh, lunch sometimes. We have the impression that all of these technologies are kind of imposed upon us or that sometimes the implementation and the use of a technology becomes uh, an end in itself, whereas it is quite important that it remains a mean to an end. And uh, here I would like to, to kind of briefly point out uh, what we could learn from artists. And a couple of months ago in Belgium, in Brussels, I had the opportunity to, um, to have a look at the work of uh, uh, Evan Roth, who's a, I think he's natively from Detroit or New York. But he's uh, an extremely smart young US uh, artist who really works on this struggle between user and users and tools. And really uh, he tries to find out through his installations and his work where's the, the sweet spot where users take again uh, or put themselves back into the driving seats and take again power over their tools. And it's way uh, kind of funny because I just found uh, exactly the same object or this uh, plastic strap which uh, Evan Roth uh, uses uh, in a couple of uh, installations in his work. And especially here, this video, it's a very short video, how to keep nasty people from putting their seats back. Uh, dot com. Uh, I highly recommend you to uh, have a look at it. It just lasts for uh, 30 seconds. But this is a very nice, smart, made uh, installation to make you reflect about, uh, at the end of the day, we just have uh, a goal to achieve, and we don't really care. Or actually, we just want to easiest, the cheapest, the most straightforward tool to really um, to get to our goal. But unfortunately, uh, sometimes in the context of the semantic web or uh, complex technologies, that's for the moment not uh, really the case. But so here I would just like to point out a short quote of uh, one of the first researchers who worked 
as a kind of an anthropologist of technology in France, uh, Jacques Perriot, who really says, and this, is, this goes very much into the direction of this user empowerment in the work of uh, Evan Roth. So for the user, the purpose of the machine is not to make the machine work, but to make it work in the service of something that has nothing to do with the technology. So at the bottom line is, at the end, you just have a goal as a user, or you want to do something, and you don't really care uh, with the type of technology that you're using. However, in the context of uh, libraries, we're all, and we were talking about this again uh, over lunch, obviously we really, as a community, we want to make the most out of technology, and we need to push the technology, uh, technological advance uh, as uh, widely as possible, but in this discussion of the, the power struggle between users and technologies and tools, I thought that this quote from the Library of Congress working group on bibliographic or the, on the future of bibliographic control was quite illustrative of again this kind of this finding the balance between uh, users and technologies, in the sense that I'll just uh, quickly read through the quote. So the library community will realize that bibliographic data need to support a variety of user, but also management and machine needs. So it will be recognized that human users do not represent the only use of bibliographic data. Instead, to an increasing degree, machine applications are their primary users. So here really at this uh, situation or the scenario where sometimes as uh, library users, but also as catalogers, as people who are working in libraries, uh, this is sometimes the point where we get a bit uh, uncomfortable and this is exactly uh, the, the point that we try to make with our project to really um, to point out how in a simple and straightforward uh, manner we can use technologies which might sound quite complex as uh, linked data concepts and semantic uh, web. Because uh, I don't know how many people here in the room know this uh, video, the Jeffrey Beale production. I always show it to my students in the first class on uh, metadata. No one has seen this? Ah. But basically, it's a, it's a very cynical video which makes uh, very much fun of our whole research project or the, the concept of semantic web and linked data. And in a way, uh, I think this video was created uh, a year or two years ago. And in a way, I can entirely agree, uh, agree upon this uh, vision um, which is put forward in the video in the sense that uh, here we just have two catalogers who are discussing the use or the, uh, of the semantic web in the context of a library where at the end of the story they just agree that basically it's utterly unclear and uh, only uh, consultants are kind of getting uh, money on uh, imposing this uh, vision or the the importance of making use of semantic web standards. But so our whole talk is in a way a kind of a reply to this kind of a cynical vision sometimes on how technologies are uh, promoted or imposed upon uh, uh, cultural heritage uh, institutions. So here we really get back to uh, the fundamental point of our project. So first of all, uh, and this is really uh, something which will be explained in detail by uh, my colleague Max. Uh, all metadata are, uh, are messy, so it's extremely important to have a look at uh, tools which you can use to kind of diagnose the, the quality of your, uh, of your metadata. In the 10 or 15 years I have been working in the field, I've never received an export of a museum or a library which was uh, completely clean. So it's just kind of a common stance or a common ground which we should uh, assume. Uh, for our uh, project and for the publication we worked on this summer, we were extremely happy to use, or it wasn't uh, obvious for us to, to find an export of metadata upon which we could work. And so uh, we we're very happy to collaborate with uh, the people of the Powerhouse Museum, which have had over the past and will have also in the future a very uh, progressive uh, vision on uh, publicly making available their data and it's also an, a very nice example of what actually happens or what other people start doing once you put out your uh, your own metadata. And last of all, uh, the third element and that's what my uh, colleague Ruben will uh, focus on. There are There is a whole exciting world of uh, possibilities which emerge, emerge once you get your local vocabularies reconciled with uh, elements which are already part of the linked data cloud, such as 
Library of Congress subject headings, but again, we're really uh, show in a very hands-on manner how this, uh, this all works. But so, um, this was just a very general introduction of the, the theme and the, the content of the, the presentation. But so, um, the, really the bulk of the, the talk of today will consist of a very practical overview of how to use Google Refine for um, metadata cleaning and reconciliation. And then at the end, really hope, or apparently uh, Robbie uh, and her colleague already told us a bit about some issues that were perhaps um, uh, present in some uh, digital library uh, projects. Really hope that at the end of the talk, we can discuss about the specific problems you have and in which way uh, our work could eventually help to um, to enhance some of your uh, metadata. But so uh, from a methodological uh, point of view, uh, the, the first step is really to, to use as a common ground that all metadata are messy and therefore it's extremely important to analyze uh, or to try to, to gather a diagnosis of the quality issues your uh, collection is faced with. Then the second step is to go uh, towards standardization and normalization. Again, we'll uh, show a lot of concrete examples on how to do that. And then the last step, or the, uh, which is in a way fundamental here, is the whole reconciliation or the mapping of your local vocabularies with um, elements which are already part of the linked data clouds. But so, uh, before I give the floor uh, to Max, I would just like uh, to briefly talk a bit about this notion of quality. Uh, again, we were just an hour ago talking about this fundamental problem of how to define quality, because at the end of the line, uh, for example, ISO or this ISO 9000 standard, which is used by the industry, just basically defines quality as fitness for purpose. A lot of engineers, IT people, or for example, this whole total data quality management program at MIT from the 90s, these people had really quite a deterministic vision upon, qual uh, upon quality, whereas it, we're living in an empirical world which keeps on moving throughout time. So at no point in time, it's really uh, fundamentally possible to say uh, in a binary way something is correct or not. Uh, so that's why it's important to realize that quality is fundamentally relative, and this gets back to the, the second sense of meta in metadata. People always think about metadata or meta in metadata as being on a more abstract level, which is the first sense. But it's also very important to think about the second sense that meta has, which is the notion of change. So uh, uh, metastase, for example, um, refers to uh, this fundamental notion of evolution throughout time. And this gets us back to really the importance of using a tool such as Google Refine, but you also have other types of tools to really uh, systematically and throughout time uh, make snapshots of uh, how your uh, metadata are uh, evolving. And uh, so for those of you who are interested in this topic, I just published with uh, my colleague Isabel Boydens uh, a paper on this in the Journal of uh, Documentation last year. But so uh, now let's just get our hands uh, into the more uh, practical part. And so uh, I'll give the floor to uh, Max, who will now really talk about the first fundamental step, uh, which is cleaning. Okay. So, uh, yes, let's go more practical. Um, I have only one slide, so <laughs> I'll be true to you <laughs> then. So, um, in order to implement all those, uh, uh, those nice um, methodologies uh, Seth was talking about, we're, we'll be making use of a tool called Google Refine, which is a free app uh, which can be used to, to improve the quality of metadata. Um, and it's quite uh, multifunctional. As uh, we, we said before, there are several steps. I, I'm going just back to show them. Uh, yeah, these three essential steps. Uh, first, to diagnose the quality issues, then to improve the quality and to reconcile. The main advantage of Google Refine is that you can perform all three steps in a single interface, which is quite handy. Okay, 
back to my one slide. And, um, and so uh, I'll, I hope to prove today that uh, it's a very easy tool and that we can perform all those different uh, operations in there. And in order to insist on the, the fact that it's a tool very easy for any user, I won't use any screencasts, but instead I'm uh, perform some uh, metadata freeing live on stage for you <laughs> here with the, um, directly in the Google Refine interface. So you notice it's uh, a bro browser interface, but it's still local. So it's run on your machine. You don't have to upload all your metadata and share them with Google, which uh, <laughs> is not what we want. So it's in, in the browser interface, but it's run locally. So starting from scratch here, um, I can load a new uh, uh, data set to create a, a new uh, Google Refined project. Um, yep. I, I choose here the um, uh, Powerhouse Museum collection, which is uh, freely do fr free to download on their website. So uh, this file here you can get also just uh, Googling Powerhouse and you can per, uh, perform uh, at home uh, on your own computer all these operations with Google Refine, which is free. Okay, so I just uh, load this file and create it's worth quotation marks. Yeah, okay. I just have to check this box and creating the project, which takes a few seconds. Okay, here we are. And you see we have uh, uh, about 75,000 uh, objects in there described in this powerhouse museum collection. So the first thing is uh, to have a good overview of, of the data in there, to have a look at them, to get to know your data. So uh, there are a number of different fields, uh, IDs, um, text fields like uh, object titles, descriptions, also uh, numbers. If you go further to the right, we have uh, dates also, categories, which will be very interesting to use. That uh, Those are keywords from uh, uh, controlled vocabularies, uh, links also, and um, dimensions, and so on and so on. So uh, all those data are uh, from a whole variety of formats. And we'll see now how we can uh, first establish a uh, uh, diagnosis of uh, what's, what's okay in there and what are the potential metadata problems and then how we can improve them in the same interface. So let's start with the record IDs. Um, obviously all objects in the collection should have an ID. So here first operation, I'll create a facet and as IDs are numerical values, it's a numeric facet. So I create, create that and Google Refine uh, finds out there are, that uh, nearly all IDs are numeric, which is what we expected. We don't have blank values, but we have non-numeric values, only three. But that's strange. So let's have a look at them. And in fact, they're non-numeric because they're blank. So why are, uh, aren't they here uh, listed as blank? It's because we have a single white space here. So, okay, it's as if they were blank and that's uh, already a problem. So we don't have anything here, we just have blank uh, rows, so we can remove them because they're meaningless. Okay, so I remove those three matching rows. And I've already performed uh, 
an operation. So I had first, uh, I diagnosed that there was a small problem. It's very easy, of course. Three uh, rows were blank. And I already removed them without affecting the, the original collection. So the file I loaded is, uh, remains unchanged. But the project loaded into Google Refine is changed. And at the end, I can export it to have a new file uh, where the quality improved. And if you do any mistake, uh, there's a nice history of undo redo here. So you can always uh, try and uh, change uh, things. You can always go back with a kind of time machine here. So that's nice too. OK, so uh, next step. Well, we've been removing blank cells, but maybe there are also duplicates in there. Objects uh, yeah, figuring twice or more in the collections. In order to see this, we'll have to sort the objects by IDs. Uh, these are numbers, so I check numbers and smallest first. That's perfect. OK, let's sort them. And um, in order, yeah, uh, the, the sorting uh, should not be uh, temporary. It should be made permanent. So I just check here, reorder these rows permanently. I want them to stay in that uh, order. OK. Um, now, if two objects in a row have the same ID, that's uh, because they're duplicates. So to see this, I'll blank down another operation, blank down all uh, consecutive objects having the same idea. I blank them down, and I immediately see uh, 84 cells were affected here on the top. Uh, so we'll have a look at the cells having a new kind of facet. In customized, fa customized facets, we have a facet by blank to find blank values. And for most objects, it's false. They're not blank. But 84 of them are blank. So we'll have a look at them here. They don't have any record ID because it was blanked down. So how do we? How could we be sure these are duplicates? Uh, we can, by switching uh, between those two uh, views here in Google Refine, have the rows view, just one row for, uh, for yeah, every different, uh, different row. But we can also switch to where, uh, records view, which I'll be doing now. And here, we have a clear view that we had a duplicate here. Those two objects are exactly the same. The title is, in the, is the same, the re registration number also, and so on and so on. So by switching to this records view, I'm sure these were real duplicates that can be removed from the collection. So I switch back to the other view, and I choose to remove all matching rows also. OK, so uh, no, it should be OK. But still, let's uh, have another facet, a blank facet on the registration number. And we see that over 100 are still blank. It's because they had a record ID, but that's all. We only had an ID and nothing else. So that's not the quality issue here. Some Objects in the collections were awarded an idea, but there's nothing corresponding to this idea. And we're not interested, obviously, in those objects right now. We should, of course, in a real world, check uh, why those IDs were attributed. But here, we don't need them, so I can also remove them. I remove all matching rows. OK. Um, so we only worked with numbers, but of course we can look at something else, like the production dates. Uh, dates should be number as well, so I uh, will check that with a numeric facet. Um, and we, we can see most, uh, most objects are blank 
for that field here I don't know if if you see it it's gray but uh, yes seven um, fifty five thousand objects don't have data at all so that's also an issue and uh, in the uh, the rema remaining ones lots of them are non numeric which is strange for a date we can see why it's because they use uh, they also use ranges okay so in the same field here we have no integrity constraints we have uh, ranges with two different dates and we have a real single dates as well in the same column okay that's an, another interesting thing to notice um, one yeah one more example here with the dimensions if I do a um, blank facet, for example, uh, on the height field, field um, okay, I, I'll ignore those that are blank, but the other ones, uh, most of them here are expressed in millimeters. So if we look, yeah, it's always millimeters. But I'll use another tool, the text filter, to see if other uh, units are used as well, for instance, centimeters. And yes, only eight objects were not expressed in millimeters, but in centimeters instead. So that, that's also a problem. Uh, uh, there's no reason why uh, those eight objects sh should be expressed in an another units. Okay. Um, we could correct them, but I wonder this right now. Uh, uh, yeah, and so on. You can perform all kind of uh, analysis on all, all uh, other fields. Here, for instance, the weight field. Uh, almost every, yeah, almost no object has uh, a height only. Uh, less than 200 have one so is this height fields really uh, yeah do, do we need this uh, this field if so f a few objects have a height uh, uh, encoded in the system okay but now I go for to the more interesting parts uh, I already talked before that's the categories Okay, the categories, uh, I told you, were are keywords from controlled vocabularies. And you can see here that uh, several keywords are put together in the same cell. So they are separated by the pipe character here. The first object is classified under botanical specimens, but also numismatics two different keywords separated uh, by the pipe character. So the first thing we need is to split uh, those keywords, but, uh, but at the same time keeping all of them linked to the right object. We can, we can do this with Google Refine. With another operation in edit cells, we have split multi-valued cells. Up, I'll do this. Uh, I have to select the right character to separate, and it's the pipe character. So, like that. Okay, working for a few seconds. Okay, that's it. So, uh, whereas we had before, we had seventy-five thousand objects. No, we have much more rows. Here you can see uh, 170,000. That's because for a single object there can be uh, many different keywords. But if we switch back to the records view, we ha still have the same number of records. It doesn't change. We didn't, didn't change anything. And the, the keywords are linked to a single object. OK. Um, now the most interesting thing is that we can have a text facet. We didn't use that yet because we didn't uh, use a text field. If we do 
a text facet will ask Google Refine to list all different values, possible values used in the collection, all different keywords. And they are listed here on the right. There are uh, just under 5,000 keywords used to describe objects in this collection. And we can uh, sort them by count to get the more popular keywords. Here we can see numismatics is the most used, followed by ceramics, clothing, and dress, and so on. Okay, and there are lots of them. And uh, we'll use this cluster functionality just here to see if um, keywords are duplicates or near duplicates. And that's a powerful functionality of Google Refine because here you can see that two different categories were used just before uh, uh, because of uh, different in a case or a space or something. Okay, and we can have a, a look at that. Uh, obviously, uh, it's always the same here. Documents uh, with or without capital letter and so on and so on. And that's, uh, yeah, here we just diagnose a problem, but we can solve it at the same time by se selecting, okay, I select everything and I want to merge everything together. So uh, th those two different, uh, those two variations will be merged to this one on the right. And you, you can change if you don't like what Google Refine uh, use as a default. So up, I select that and in less than seconds, it was done and 37,000 cells were edited. <laughs> so that's cool. <laughs> okay, and we have different uh, methods to, um, to cluster them together. We can switch to another one, for, an, for instance, Ngram fingerprints here, which is more aggressive, sort of. And uh, you, yeah, it's a, a good way to, to uh, remind you that uh, Google Refine is the tool, but you're the master because Google Refine can make mistakes. And here, you have to, to uh, yeah, to to have a, a good look because if we select everything, the Google Refine would be making a mistake. Can you see that by merging things together? <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> yeah, shirts and t-shirts, exactly. So shirts and t-shirts are very uh, similar, but obviously they're not really the same. So well, we, we could argue, argue that they, they could fit in the same category, but uh, here we have two distinct categories, so we can select everything to merge unless shirt and t-shirts, we can keep them apart. And we recluster everything, okay. Uh, more things are merged. We have even more aggressive techniques, but I won't use them just to show you because it's, yeah, it's uh, puppets and muppets, no. <laughs> and things like that. I have other funny, Examples, I think, dresses and presses. Uh. <laughs> so you have to be careful, of course, not to uh, let Google Refine do anything. The user <laughs> has to remain, uh, and, oh, what else? Okay, wallets and mallets and so on and so on. Yeah, it's funny. Okay, so I, I won't be merging that. Um, and here we've already reduced the number of categories used because we uh, cluster them together. Still, of course, uh, there's always the problem of having uh, very specific categories used only for one or two objects. That's another problem. We can't solve anything. For instance, here we have that very interesting category, toy rabbits. <laughs> Of course, there are not so many category, uh, not so many objects in the collection uh, corresponding to th that keyword. But it should have. Uh, if I run text filter, uh, I 
if it's working. Um, uh, animals, is it working now? Oops. Okay, it should have fit in toy animals maybe, which is uh, more general. So still, there there are other problems, uh, but the cluster functionality is a, a good way to have a, a first and very quick and efficient clustering to improve the quality. Okay, now I'll give the mic to Ruben, who's going to, to go through the next step, which is reconciliation. No, I've not been to the Museum of Modern Art yet. I plan to do it. So what have I been drawing here then? Well, sadly, this is the current metadata landscape. This is how it works now. It's all islands. Every collection is in its own island. There's a powerhouse museum somewhere. There's larger collections. There's also smaller collections. But the general thing is they're all islands. And what do we really want us as metadata people? It, it's connections. It, it's all about, it's not about this one collection, but it's, it's about how those collections relate to each other. And, and basically, by just having metadata cleaned up, we're not yet making those bridges. So the next part, reconciliation, is going to be about those bridges. It's going to be about how can we use the metadata to create some universal sense of, of meaning, to create metadata that can be shared across different collections? And the idea is that we're going to use a controlled vocabulary. So the vocabulary you've seen now was a more ad hoc vocabulary used by the Powerhouse Museum. But the Powerhouse Museum has its own, and, and other museums have, have different ones. So there's no real interoperability there. So what we're going to use is uh, centralized vocabulary. And the idea is to link every collection to that centralized vocabulary. And in that way, they'll also be linked to each other indirectly. So this is what I'm going to show you now. So practically, how does that work? Well, let me quickly go to my slides. So. Who of you is familiar with LCSH, the Library of Congress Subject Headings? You've heard about that, I assume. Did you hear good things about it, bad things? Who says? OK, who says it's a good thing? It, it's everybody. Great news. <laughs> it has some problems. So, so controlled vocabularies are not heaven yet, but, but they can be really useful, as I'll just show in a second. So the idea um, of using the um, LOC subject headings is not only they are controlled, but they're also accessible online. They're freely accessible. So they're both human readable, but also machine readable. So there's also a machine readable format accessible online. So let me maybe quickly show you that on the, on the website. So this is the, um, LC, the Library of Congress website. And basically, you have the different uh, subject headings over here. And some of them are really specific, some of them are really general, but they all have the relationship to each other. So you can uh, know which one is the more specific one of another, and so on. And the interesting thing for, uh, for us is that you can also download um, the whole thing. And once it's downloaded, you can use it to reconcile a collection using Google Refine. So that's what we've done. We've downloaded it, and basically, um, the data format they've used is a semantic web format. So who's familiar with the semantic web here? And who says it's a good thing? <laughs> That's everybody again. That's great. No. So, um, but linked data and the semantic web provide really cool tools because they're linked together, similarly like collections should be linked together, but they're also queryable. So, we just put the whole um, LCSH in a database, which we can 
query using Sparkle, and Sparkle is basically the semantic web query language, so it's like SQL for the semantic web. So let me go back to uh, Google Refine. And I'll just use a small clean subset of the uh, Powerhouse Museum collection. So this is uh, the collection after it has been cleaned using the steps uh, Max has shown. And basically here we're interested in the categories field, of course, because this is the field that other items and other collections are also going to have. So it's this field we're going to uh, reconcile to this centralized controlled vocabulary. How does it work? Well, what I did before is I added the uh, LCSH um, database, the Sparkle database, to uh, the system. Uh, on the website are the details on how you can do it yourself, but it's all technical stuff, so I won't bother you with it. But the important thing is that it's really easy to reconcile. So I just go up to categories and I choose reconcile, start reconciling. And then I choose uh, from which to which um, centralized vocabulary I want to reconcile, in this case, the LCSH. And what it's doing now, it's basically scanning through all the different types I have, and based on that, it will guess what kind of elements I'm working with. In this case, I'm indeed working with concepts, so scores concepts. And basically, this is it. So now it has determined what to do, and now I click the Start Reconciling button, and it just does what it has to do. And one thing you should notice is that it's going really fast. So imagine having to do this all uh, by yourself on manual. I mean, my laptop is currently standing on the LCSH. I don't know if you can see it, but those big books are the, the full thing. So if you have to do it manually, you, you'd spend hours on that. But no, look, it's, it's already done, in fact. Oh, and what's the difference? Well, for example, um, a few minutes ago, there was also botanical specimens here. But it was in black. No, it's in, in blue. It's, it's a link, actually. So the thing is, if I click on this, I go to the Botanical uh, Specimens web page. And what's the difference? Well, a few minutes ago, Botanical Specimens was only a text, and it had meaning to us because we understand English, but machines don't. But thanks to this link, it now also means something to machines. It's not just the letters B, O, T, and so on. It's really this category of LCSH. And this category is also used by other vo um, vocabularies and by other collections. So this is a whole world of difference. And this will actually enable the coupling and the interaction of different collections together. And this is it. So this was really, really fast. And this is really powerful. So don't be misled by the speed of Google Refine, because, because this is really an important concept. If you want to do the integration thing, and I think this is what we all should be working towards. So I'll just quickly uh, run through the most important parts of the, uh, where is this? Of the website. I don't know, Ruben, if you want to just quickly do, uh, show the, the pages of the, the website. So I don't know, like, Regarding the reconciliation, I don't know if I should just keep this in my hands. Right. Voila. Um, so just uh, the process that uh, Ruben was just uh, demonstrating uh, five minutes ago was in a way extremely powerful. But uh, to take, for example, I probably uh, a best example would be in a geographical area. So let's suppose that we had uh, one, uh, a record about uh, some object in Buenos Aires. If, we, if you just have the, the meaningless text string, it's obvious to us humans that Buenos Aires is uh, a part of Latin America or a capital in Latin America. But from the moment on that you perform this reconciling with uh, an authority vocabulary, you also automatically uh, attract or import the whole hierarchy of the different concepts. So we would also, uh, once you have performed the reconciliation, if a user, for example, does a look, look up on uh, Argentina or Latin America, after the reconciliation, that user will also find the records with uh, Argentina. So that's really a fundamental aspect of this whole reconciliation um, process. But so uh, all of the things which we have been uh, talking about during this presentation are in a way completely available on the website. So if you want to uh, have a look at uh, Max's dynamic uh, cleaning uh, and you can't 
uh, or you uh, just want to repeat the same steps on the, the data set of the powerhouse museum. So here you have a very detailed uh, explanation of all of these steps and we've been really glad that uh, different people uh, have been using these sets within their metadata classes or within uh, at universities uh, with students. And uh, also regarding the reconciliation, uh, here also again you have all the, the different steps. This can be a bit more technical, uh, especially regarding the um, identifying the LCSH as a reconciliation uh, source. But as you pro perhaps already or also saw within the interface, you could also just easily take, for example, DBpedia or I don't know what the other, or Freebase, are uh, just default uh, reconciliation sources, which you can, just, you can just tick a box next to them and then see, for example, uh, so with the powerhouse uh, data collection, we had 80% uh, of reconciliation success. But you could also have a look at what happens, for example, if you try to reconcile uh, those terms with, uh, for example, DBpedia or uh, Freebase. Um, so those were probably the, the most important uh, steps to have a look at. So uh, for us as uh, researchers, it's very important to have uh, access to uh, interesting and as messy as possible data or metadata. So if you have bad metadata, please uh, do not uh, hesitate to send them to us. It allows us to write uh, interesting papers uh, about. And so uh, now for the moment, we're working with uh, Jill Hamilton of the Libra National Library of Scotland. I'm not saying they have bad metadata. They're actually very, very uh, interesting but because on uh, five or six different levels they are using um, authority, uh, authority files in a very uh, detailed manner. So probably over the next, next few months we'll uh, develop a case study based upon uh, their uh, data. But that will mainly focus on the reconciliation especially for the metadata cleaning part, we're really still looking for, uh, or probably we should just launch a competition on the website so the people that send us the messiest uh, metadata will get a t-shirt or, uh, I don't know, we'll, uh, we'll get a prize or uh, voila. But so uh, this was really kind of a, a very global approach of uh, what's the project about, what's the whole methodology. And then now for us, uh, one of the more interesting parts of getting here to the US and uh, to Colombia would be really to see how, in a way, you think that uh, the methodology or uh, Google Refiner, the whole reconciliation approach, could be uh, valuable towards you. So um, I would be more than happy to just, I don't know in, in which format we could organize the discussion. Voila, but uh, perhaps, first of all, if people have some specific questions regarding the cleaning or the reconciliation. Yes? Um, did you test at all how more five works with non-Roman characters? With non-Roman? Yeah. Non-Roman non -Roman characters. Yeah, with accents as well. Yeah, uh, no, um, I'm actually referring uh, to other, so like okay. Hebrew, yeah. Uh, but only uh, one day at the University of Maryland. I mean, it was yeah, it's working in Unicode, so it's not so sure. sure. No. We didn't. Yes. I, I swear I heard you say 80% in there someplace. 80%? 80%. Yeah. 80%. Uh, are you familiar with what my friends know about the 80 20 rule? So ah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's the Pareto law that with 80%, uh, with you get. 80% uh, of your results with 20% of uh, uh, your effort, but to get the rest of the 20%, you need to spend 80% of your effort. Yeah, but uh, in a way, yeah, it, we haven't really uh, thought about that. But uh, that's a uh, yeah, I'm thinking we have, but you should see it this way. It would be really idealistic to, to just assume that that everything would work and be reconciled. It's a magic. It's a tool, but but. I mean, 80 percent can be, and with some parts of work can be reconciled in the automatically, and you only have to do the 20 percent instead of the 100 percent. And yes, this will be the more difficult records, of course, by definition. But you only have to deal with those. So. But in a way, I, I don't think in, in it's it's not really the goal to have like 100 percent reconciliation. That all we, I, for me personally, uh, I never expected that we. Uh, 
would have uh, managed to, to get to, uh, to that level. But so just having a completely automated match for 80% of the objects of the, so in total we almost had 80,000 records was quite a big surprise uh, to us. I think you can see that as a benefit. I mean, all the easy cases, you don't have to look at them. They're done for you. And the difficult cases, you need your concentration and you can get it. No. I agree. I think mean, it's right. Because I guess it's real far real facts. Mm -hmm. um, so I work in large scale collections. I do our off site storage facility. And so I deal with sort of the same sort of thing. So I get 80% percent done very quickly. How do you do your quality control to know that your 80% is sort of 100% innocent? Yeah. So uh, this whole project is kind of based on, uh, on a paper we've, we've written over the summer, which is currently in review. Uh, but so here in this paper, you'll find the whole methodology which we used to, um, to analyze the, the quality of the reconciliation process. Uh, so f the first thing uh, we did is just to take uh, a big sample. So I personally spent probably a week uh, in July when uh, the sun was shining outside my office to, uh, to really have a look at uh, to see, I really expected to find a lot of uh, synonyms or poly, uh, problems relating to polysemy, but uh, for the five, uh, four or five hundred uh, records, um, which I manually analyzed, no single record provided uh, a false match. So I really expected to find examples of um, What's a uh, polysynonym, for example, ha. Uh, there's an example in the paper. Which, uh, for example, uh, uh, wood. Wood can be interpreted as the material or uh, as woods, the, the part. But uh, the huge advantage of the LCSA, uh, LCSH is that they never use any ambiguous terms within their collection. So from the moment on that you have a match, uh, it's also a disadvantage in the sense that for a lot of terms, which I thought would very, were very easy to reconcile, like cup, uh, cup wasn't reconciled. Because cup, in a way, can have multiple uh, significances. So in, with, uh, when I was analyzing these 500 terms, I just... Uh, I wasn't able, I, in a way I was very disappointed because I hoped to find some rare uh, examples to just to, to prove that there were sometimes some, um, some misunderstandings, but I was completely unable to find uh, a record which, which was falsely matched. But so that was the first approach, just a manual uh, a lookup. And then uh, Ruben worked on uh, a kind of a methodology to see how deeply the, um, the terms are actually matched. I think we would all agree that if we just speak about uh, terms like church or uh, wood or a table and you manage to reconcile that, all librarians would say, ah, okay, fair enough. But even if you, with uh, automatic uh, image recognition, probably a machine can detect a person or like low level semantics within an image or in a document. But uh, so we developed this uh, method to see how deeply embedded within the structure of uh, LCSH were the terms um, reconciled um, to really see that a lot of these terms, and for example, rabbits, what was it, rabbit toy? Uh, you really have lots of extremely detailed uh, semantics which have been uh, reconciled. But if you want to have more kind of details on that whole methodology, just have a look at the paper which is uh, online on, uh, on the website. But it's a very important question, uh, how to analyze the quality of the reconciliation. In a way, uh, it's kind of just uh, very populist to say, oh, we managed to reconcile 80%. Uh, it's a very important question. To, uh, from those 80%, are we speaking about important terms or just about low-level semantics? But in this case study, we really found out that a lot of the, the reconciled terms were actually very useful for uh, information retrieval or for the uh, use of um, the terms to, to find objects through an OPAC. Uh, yes? So in the LCSH, there's, um, in the SCOS, there's graph label and variant label. And you're using prepositioning as variant label? Uh, probably let's get rid of the prepositioning. Yeah. 
Ruben uh, also died when he worked uh, about complicated uh, answers. So um, I think that the ref labels, so the preferred labels, and they're all unique. So this is a one thing. So um, first we did the uh, reconciliation with all the unique labels. And then we did um, reconciliation with all the alternate, uh, alternate labels as, as well. And um, as far as they didn't conflict with the preferred labels. Because um, you have the, the F synonyms and then so on, and in the preferred level, uh, labels they, they avoid the synonyms. For the uh, alternate labels, they don't. So we um, only looked at those that didn't cause any conflicts. The effect would be causing a smaller rate of reconciliation than we could have achieved, but at least we're certain that everything is correct. But what was the difference in uh, I don't know the success rate? Right? It's, uh, it's significant about it. It was um, at least 20%, I think it was more 30 or 40 units. So alternate labels are really important. Sebastian Chan next week or uh, at uh, Lodlam event uh, hosted by the New York Public Library on the 22nd or 23rd uh, and over the next few months we are going to work on uh, an extension for the Chrome browser which uh, once the user installs the, this extension and you're on the web page of uh, a collection database and having a look for example at the, the rabbit toy uh, that you just have automatically and on the fly a pop-up uh, on your screen saying ah so apparently you're interested in uh, rabbit toys it's important to know that in uh, this uh, collection database you have an object which is identified by exactly the same subject heading so probably this object will also be to interest of you and so this is this would be a very practical uh, kind of added value towards end users and we're also in parallel working, uh, I don't know if any one of you knows the, this open source uh, collections management sift, uh, system, Collective Access. So over the last few years, I've worked together with them. And so uh, we've been thinking about how linked data could also just help catalogers in the sense that within the cataloging backend, uh, also on the fly, when you start typing in certain terms, there's already within uh, Collective Access kind of a, you can, uh, activate web services to have on the fly when you type in uh, rabbit toy it already kind of uh, automatically uh, pops up the, the subject heading uh, but then a second element on which we would like to work is then if it finds uh, uh, rabbit toy in LCSH that it also has a look at the documentation or the the, the metadata which have been added in other uh, collections and which in just have to work on how we're going to display this information in a pop-up or in a user interface, that it also just shows all of the metadata related uh, to that type of ob object from other collection databases. So as a cataloger, when you're describing an object, that in a very quick and in a very intuitive manner, you see, ah, I'm describing this object, which has already been described by other people uh, in other museums. Perhaps uh, there are elements which I can uh, reuse. So that would be kind of an added value towards catalogers. But uh, so over the next two to three months, we're all kind of busy working on those two, uh, those two steps. But so for us, it's extremely important to have access to, uh, to metadata from uh, cultural heritage, heritage sector. So if there are people amongst you who are interested in this whole uh, field and want to collaborate with us, um, please absolutely do not hesitate to contact us and we'd be more than happy to, to work together over the next few months. It uh, would hopefully be a, a good thing for your collection or for your uh, policy, but it would, would also just be very helpful for, for us to have solid uh, data to work with while developing these tools and while writing papers. Um, but so uh, are there any persons here in the room who would think that all of these kind of steps 
would uh, be of immediate use to their uh, collection? And if so, how or have, have any of you worked with uh, other tools or uh, developed some metadata quality uh, methodologies or steps? And if so, how have you done them or performed them in your uh, institution? Well, I'm curious about the export. Like, how easy is it to export it in a format? I mean, in order to get it back into whatever your data store is. I mean, for example, I, I, I'm the repository manager, and our, you know, our metadata is in the Fedora yeah. uh, instance, but we also have a, a solar index. You know, so, would it be possible to you know, manipulate stuff and send it back into the solar index? So, uh, there's an export for that. Okay. So you, you have all the, uh, the traditional formats, let's say, terms of and so on, but that's not particularly interesting. What's interesting to us as uh, semantic web people is that you can go uh, to RDF formats, so do the link and, and, and that. So um, this is also an advantage because you then have semantically enriched data, so semantics come actually with the data. But the beauty of um, find it also it's open source and that several plugins exist. In fact, the RDF is not standard in there. It's a plugin made by Derry Galloway. So you can have plugins for different formats and it's all open source. You can easily plug in existing plugins. So it works really well for that. But what is fairly complex, but also from research-wise very interesting for us, is uh, now that we've been collaborating with the people of the National Library in Scotland, is that they have a very complex, uh, highly complex relational database in which they're using eight or nine different uh, vocabularies, or uh, controlled vocabularies. But then for us, or Google Refine just needs a flat file list. You can't really export or feed it uh, SQL or some uh, relational uh, format, you need to kind of just flatten it. Uh, and this from a methodolog methodological uh, point of view, so Max uh, kind of annoyed him over the last few weeks when we were preparing for this trip to try uh, to manipulate or to, to really to flatten this big export that we received from Scotland and to kind of uh, push it down to something which we could feed into uh, Google Refine, but we were obliged to kind of simplify the semantics before by simplifying uh, the, yeah, the values of that database in order to put it into Google Refine, but obviously it's a bit bizarre, or we actually had to, uh, so the whole goal of the project is to uh, add semantics, but in order to do, th do so, we had to kind of to simplify the very rich formats in which it originally exists. So there, there's a whole complexity of kind of getting the data into, uh, to flatten it, to get it into uh, Google Refine. In a way, it would be better to find a way to get it, uh, Google Refine or something else, automatic or automatically incorporated within your workflow or within your repository, so you don't have to kind of flatten things before you uh, perform all these uh, operations. This integration, by the way, is also possible in an automated manner. So now we've performed all the steps manually, but you can just record your steps and just play them back on any data set in an automated way. So this could also be handy. Have, have you given any thought to, uh, you're only working with, right now with topical subjects. Have you given any thought to cleanup of data, dealing with names? Uh, so hopefully uh, on the 23rd uh, at the New York Public Library we'll also just experiment with uh, name authority files or data. Um, but for example, with the, uh, within this export we received from Scotland, there are uh, a lot of fields related to uh, names of organizations, uh, historical figures. Um, but for the moment, the kind of the big experiment we did with the powerhouse. Uh, data does not really include, unfortunately, uh, names or uh, dates. And the also thing for names is, so uh, Refine was originally a product called, um, what was it called? Uh, Freebase and Gridworks. So Gridworks from Freebase, so the Freebase integration is really good. And Freebase happens to have this huge library about persons. So if you want to do person reconciliation, I think that the Freebase and will work really good because it's a native and it's, mm -hmm. uh, you will have really good results from that. Thank you. I work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and we're currently trying to do a 
in the area of 22 installations of our collectives management system, one for each department, and we're trying to integrate that into one. We're working right, right now on uh, just trying to uh, consolidate uh, constituent names, artist names. Uh, and what kind of system are you uh, integrating everything? Well, it, there's, oh. a, there's a bespoke and uh, custom, custom systems that we've developed in-house to do so. Okay. Plus, you match to reconcile these names. Just uh, the MySQL database at the back end. So. It, yeah, it's a SQL based. Well, it's a it's a, it's a proprietary uh, SQL based uh, collections management uh, database mm -hmm. system. So we export that data out, as well as the mash algorithms. Very similar to what you're doing here, but um, but but custom built and therefore not not so flexible. Um, so uh, one, one one of the things we deal with, of course, is that um, you might people, people might have the same name, but be different people. Okay, so uh, I was wondering how this system, number five, sort of deals with multi, multi-field uh, reconciliation. That for, for places might be similar, right? We've got Paris, Georgia, Paris, France, and we have separate fields for those for cities. Oh, you yeah, know, can integrate the second or the third parameter. Right. Oh, okay. I don't know. Well, of course, you, you can do some smart tricks there, like if the fields. Um, so you need you, you can you can concatenate them, but that's just a trick, mm -hmm. of course. The biggest story would need be that um, you do multi-column reconciliation, which uh, is possible as it's implemented inside the refined code base. And I think some of the um, reconciliation tools can use it. The RDF extension doesn't have it yet, but I think there are plans on implementing this uh, to the extension. Because again, the tune need to hard need that we have. We yeah, suppose person and indeed with a similar or with the same name, but you also have the, this, uh, let's say, the idea of authorship of the work, maybe. Then it should be possible to, to do these things. And it won't be difficult thanks to the power of all the links between the data and the So, short answer it will be possible. It is already partly possible, but stay tuned and uh, thank you for the comments. Great, thanks. It's probably not really well known, but the um, Library of Congress. Name authority file. There's all of them um, at ID where you work, but yeah. there are one of the formats that's available now is, is Mads RDF, which actually parses out the fast, so you could separately identify the Paris part of the oh, right. part of the France part if you use that. Is it, is it non-exploded non-exploded mm -hmm. 
could find out like what those expressions are? Are there any kind of? I have two answers there. And it's, yeah. At first step is a technical thing. That's, that's true. But um, it's one of the things, I, it also depends on how you explain it. I mean, I can explain anything in a very difficult way. Nobody will understand that. But that's not the purpose. And the purpose <laughs> of the website uh, is, is to explain Google Refine basics in, in, an, in an understandable way. And I think we could do the same for the expression language because there are various, co uh, various common expressions that are used all the time that are just easy to explain. And all the more, since they're really common, we, we could also, maybe we should do that, just provide a page with, with common expressions yeah, and yeah. kind of library yeah. that you can use. And, and, and so you don't even have to understand, or fu fully understand what they do, you can just use them. And this would be the That's it, and you could do that on the free and then that would be fun to have like yeah. ten uh, most popular. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would have been relevant. Really yeah. 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 yeah, but again, um, well, if you're speaking about the top ten most used, if you have a problem and say, okay, how should we do this? Just send us an email and we will add it to the top ten. If no people ask it, we can rank it higher in the top ten and so on. So just send your problems. We're really. interested to know what you're thinking. Are all your contacts listed on your website? Yeah. Ah, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, but on the, there's just a general uh, email address yes. who wants to stay uh, anonymous. So you can, get, <laughs> you can just mail the info at freemonday.org or just any of our first names at freemonday.org. No, the paper, all. Yeah, you the paper. Yeah, you. No, sorry. Yeah. You're on the paper, all. So it's uh, freeamazedata.org slash freeamazedata.pdf. Uh, yeah, that's also on the page. Everything is on there, and it's on the works. If you really need to hear you, I And so, uh, but I probably already, uh, I just saw that I actually skipped four slides uh, at the end. But so, uh, <laughs> I, uh, well, I won't bore you uh, with a lot of extra information, but uh, was it actually something? Ah, yeah, yeah. But actually, this could kind of wrap up a bit uh, the talk. In a way, the, the whole goal is kind of to, to get back here to this, uh, to this notion of uh, empowering users to, to get uh, to grips with, uh, with tools, and we hope just by having demonstrated a quite a simple but also still a powerful tool, ask Google Refine to really how catalogers, librarians can really on their own uh, without the help of any um, IT experts really kind of test out the added value of linked data and semantic uh, web on your own. Voila, but so we hope that uh, this has been interesting and helpful uh, to you. And again, uh, we'd be very uh, motivated to get in touch with uh, with all of you, if you have interesting data to to share with us, thank you. Thank you.